It's not fair, really, is it? <coughs> Me having a cold, not feeling well on my birthday weekend. It's really not fair. It's not fair that Aaron can play the guitar so well and sing better than me. <laughs> and he looks better than me. It's not fair that Stuart can run as far as me. And the average teenager says it's not fair eight and a half times a day. Would you believe? An hour? <laughs> Probably. It's just not fair and... We all want justice, we all want fairness, but all around us we see injustice and we see unfairness. We see little children on the streets of Pakistan struggling to breathe because poisonous fumes are affecting their airways. We see people who've made choices right through their life, all the right health choices, we see them struck down with cancer. And we think, what's that all about? We see corruption and abuse in politics, in the workplace. We see bullying in our schools. And we say it's not fair and we demand justice. And today we look at the trial of Jesus and we see just how unfair that is. We see an illegal trial, an unfair trial, Actually, we see an abominable trial. And this is what we're going to have a look at today in Mark chapter 14. So if you've got your Bibles, please do open up at Mark chapter 14 and verse uh, 53. And let's, let's just pray together before we, we, we get into that. Father God. We just want to ask that you would just help us right now to, to open our hearts, open our ears, and hear you speaking to us. And make a difference, Lord, in our lives through your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Last week, Kieran spoke in verses 43 to 53. He spoke of Judas, Judas coming to betray Jesus. He led the religious leaders to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. They took him away and they brought him to the Sanhedrin. And we saw that the Sanhedrin was a group of religious leaders, the highest religious leaders in the, in the land, really, the highest religious court in the land, containing various Jewish sects. There was the the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and they all had various different religion, religious, political, and cultural and social views, which meant that frequently there were many disputes in the, within the Sanhedrin amongst themselves, and they could rarely agree on anything. It was just like the Houses of Parliament. And they were united, though, in one thing. They all wanted Jesus dead. So here we see Jesus dragged before the Sanhedrin to be tried. Let's have a look, a closer look at verses 55 to 59. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even then their testimony did not agree. It was an abominable trial. It was ab an abominable trial, first of all, because of what they said. Because of what they said. What did they say? They were looking for evidence in verse 55. They couldn't find anything real to pin down on Jesus, so they looked to fabricate evidence against Jesus. And in verse 56, we see he was testified against and falsely accused in 57. They gave a false testimony. And they twisted his words. It's horrible, isn't it, when people 
falsely accuse you. It's horrible when they take the grain of truth in some of your words and they twist it to mean something completely different than what you meant, meant it to mean. Yet they twisted Jesus' words. They said, he said, I will destroy this temple. Did Jesus ever say that? Jesus never said, I will destroy this temple. In John in chapter uh, two, uh, two, Jesus says, and he's talking to the money changers that are abusing the house of his father. And he says, you destroy this temple. He's pointing at himself. You are going to destroy. I'm not going to destroy it. You are going to destroy this temple. And he was talking about the temple of his body. He was talking about the death that he was to suffer. So they twisted his words. And this, their testimony could not agree. But it was an abominable trial, not just because of what they said. It was a, an abominable trial because of who he was. This is who? This is God. This is the creator of the universe, the one who spoke and everything came into being. The one who, who made the rules is now being accused of breaking the rules by his own creation. Isn't that scandalous? The one who made the rules was accused of breaking the rules by his own creation. Yet, he says nothing. Until finally, the high priest steps up and the high priest asks him a question. And it's a clear question. It's a yes or no question. The high priest says in verse 60, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony the men bring against you? Are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? Are you the Messiah? And Jesus speaks and Jesus utters two words. And after these two words, the high priest goes into a rage. He rents his clothes. He condemns him of death. He accuses him of blasphemy. Because Jesus says, I am. Are you the Messiah? I am. So what was Jesus doing here? Was he claiming to be the Messiah? Is that why the high priest was in such a rage? <clears throat> I don't think it was. I don't think the high priest was in a rage because Jesus claimed to be the Messiah. You see, in the Jewish mind, and in the religious leader's mind at the time, the Messiah was just going to be a great savior that God was going to send to save his people and free them from tyranny, from the Romans, from oppression. We now know that much more than that, the Messiah was much more than that. The Messiah was not just a great savior, a great leader, a great deliverer. And Jesus reveals exactly who he is in two words that he answers the high priest with. Those two words are, are you the Messiah? I am. I am. What's Jesus saying? Is he saying, yes, I'm the Messiah? No, he's not. He's not saying I'm the Messiah. He's saying far more than that. Where have we heard those two words before, I am? We've heard them in Exodus and in the Old Testament, haven't we? We've heard them in Exodus when Moses goes to God and says, okay, if I go to, God, if I go to the Israelites and say, God has sent me to you, they're going to say, what is his name? Who is this God? And the Old Testament tells us that God said to Moses, this is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent you. I am has sent you. This was the name of God himself. Not just some great savior that's going to come in and free the Jews from oppression. But God himself. The Jews were not expecting that. The Jews were not expecting God himself to come and save them. 
But that is exactly what has happened. And that is actually exactly who Jesus is. And that is exactly why this trial is so abominable. Because here, in front of the Sanhedrin, the religious court, standing accused, is God himself. And Jesus says, I am. And so the high priest is enraged and condemns him to be worthy of death. Which brings us on to the third point of why this trial was abominable. It was abominable because of what they did to him. They condemned him as death. They spat at him. They blindfolded him. They struck him with their fists. They said, prophesy. Who, who's doing this? Who, who is it that's doing all of this? In my head, sometimes I'm thinking, oh, it's, it's, it's the guards, it's the Romans. It's, it wasn't. It was the religious leaders that were doing this. How abominable is that? To the Son of God. It was indeed an abominable trial. But Jesus was not the only person on trial that day. I think quite often when we read the account of Mark here, we read it in terms of Jesus is on trial and then there's Peter's denial. But actually when Mark wrote this passage, I don't think that's what he meant. I think what he meant is he was talking about the trial of Jesus and the trial of Mark. Sorry, the trial of Peter. The trial of Jesus and the trial of Peter. And what, what Mark is doing is he's putting these two things together in a literary device. Doctor of literature called? Called juxtaposition. Yes. Called juxtaposition. Juxtaposition is an act or an instance of placing two elements close together or side by side in order to compare and contrast the two to show similarities or differences. And Mark, and Mark is deliberately putting the trial of Jesus and the trial of Peter side by side so that we can see some of those differences. So let's just have a, a little look and see what we can do to compare the trial of Jesus and the trial of Peter, to just bring out those differences. So Susie, you're going to be right on the button here for the next 18 clicks. Are you ready? Right, what's the first one? The first one is Jesus and Peter. Oh gosh, I can't read that. Question, say, he was questioned. He was questioned by, now here you can help me out. Who was Jesus questioned by? The what, who was Jesus questioned by? The Sanhedrin, the highest religious court in the land. Who was Peter questioned by? That's right, a servant girl, a maid. In the context of society in the time that we're talking about, what was the status of the servant girl? She was? She was at a very low status. She had a very low status for, for three reasons. One, she was female. Two, she was young. It's described in the, in the, in the scriptures as a, as, a, as a girl. And three, her job as a servant. She was the lowest of the lowest of the low. So Jesus is being interrogated by the highest court in the land, whereas Peter is being interrogated by what has been regarded in society at the time as the lowest of the low. What else have we got, Susie? He was accused. Jesus was accused. Jesus was accused of being the Messiah, of all sorts of things. He was accused falsely. Peter was accused of being with Jesus. Was that right? He was. Peter was accused of being a Galilean. Was that right? It was right. So Jesus was accused falsely, but Peter was accused absolutely correctly. What else have we got? Jesus' reaction. 
Jesus led like a lamb to the slaughter. He said nothing. He said nothing. Whereas Peter, he denied it. I don't know him. I don't know Jesus. Who did Jesus trust? Jesus trusted in God. In fact, there's a verse in the New Testament that says, he made no threats, but entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Jesus trusted God. He didn't feel the need to, uh, to justify himself. He trusted that God would do the right thing. Whereas Peter trusted himself to get out of this mess. Jesus acted with grace. Kieran told us last week about how when Jesus was arrested in the garden, how the high priest's servant's ear was cut off. And what did Jesus do? He just acted in grace. And he healed the ear of that man. Whereas Peter, he called curses down on himself. Jesus was motivated to save us. Peter was motivated to save himself. You see the contrast? You see that absolute difference? Similar situations, but Peter and Jesus dealing with it in completely different ways. <clears throat> Is this fair? Go back to the beginning. Is this fair? Let me just read this to you. It's a verse in the New Testament, a few verses in the New Testament that says, He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Going back to the beginning where we acknowledge that we all want justice, we all want fairness. And reading about Jesus and his trial, we look and we cry out, it's not fair, and we demand justice. Do we really want justice? We need to be careful when we demand justice of God. We need to be very careful that we don't always ask for justice because if we did ask for justice, then actually it would not be him on that cross. It will be us on that cross. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. So what we need is not so much justice, but we need God's grace. We need grace. And that's what Jesus displays here. Can anybody tell me who wrote those words? It was Peter. It was Peter. It was, the, it was Peter. Peter, the man who rashly said to Jesus, Jesus, I will never leave you. I'll never disown you who we read in the passage today, failed him miserably, was able to be restored by Jesus and look back towards the end of his life and write these words, that he himself bore my sins. He bore my failure in his body on the cross. Isn't that wonderful that Peter could say that? Peter, who was such a failure, Peter, who so messed up, Peter, who was weeping bitterly in the passage that we read today, was able to pen those beautiful words celebrating the grace of Jesus in dying for me. Peter failed, and if we are honest, we all fail, and I fail, and I'm sorry, and I fail God, and I fail you, my brothers and sisters. But because of grace, 
because he bore my sins in his body on the cross, I can die to sin and live to righteousness. And this is wonderful. And this is part of the story of the weekend that changed the world. Our little logo there on the bottom says, Jesus changing hearts and changing lives. And that is what it's all about. And Jesus is changing hearts and lives still. So we mess up. As I close, just a few little thoughts to encourage us and to get us to think as we go through the rest of this week. The first is this really, to, to, to recognize that we do mess up. Jesus told us, he told Peter and his disciples just that same morning, or that evening, he says, remember, your flesh is weak. Your flesh is weak. God knows that my flesh is weak. God knows your flesh is weak. He knows that. That is why we need a savior. That is why we need somebody to take our place. That is why Jesus stepped in to do what we could never do. So we don't need to constantly beat ourselves up because we fail, because we will. But Jesus has become that savior, taking our place. But what we do need to do is we need to take those words of Jesus that he said that evening when Judas came with the high priests, and we need to watch and pray. We need to watch and pray. We need to watch out for the, those things which are going to drag us down, which are going to make us fail God, which are going to make us fail other people, and watch and pray. And when we say watch, we do not just mean watching like we watch television. The word watch there is the word that is used of a night watchman. Somebody keenly on the lookout, somebody alert, somebody who is looking for the first sign of trouble so they can send the alarm bells out. Do we do that? We need to do that more. And we need to cover that with prayer. Watch and pray. But looking at Jesus and looking at his, his example, we also need, in the face of opposition, to act in grace. And as I was looking on the internet, I saw many different examples and illustrations of grace. But I want to give you and share with you an example here today that is very live and very real and very close to this place. And that's an example that Sarah Shipley has shared with us in our home groups on many occasions of what she did. And the story that she tells is that she was in work and there was a particular colleague that she was working very, very closely with. And that relationship, having started off very good, started to break down. And this colleague went to the headmaster because Sarah was working in a school as a teacher. And this colleague went to the headmaster and said to the headmaster, listen, I'm, re I'm really struggling with Sarah. She's doing this, that, and the other. So the headmaster very wisely called both of them together and said, let's chat this through. And said to the colleague, okay, tell us now, what is it that concerns you about Sarah? And this colleague went and said what Sarah had done and what Sarah had said and what Sarah had not done and what... And the headmaster just after the first point, said, okay, thank you. Sarah, how do you respond to that? And Sarah just said, I'm so sorry. I did not know you felt that way. I will make sure that never happens again. And so they went on to point two. And the same thing happened. And point three. And Sarah, after every point of accusation, she could have defended herself. She could have explained why she, she was not at fault. She, she just said, I'm sorry. And after every point, she just responded saying, I'm sorry you feel that way. I will make sure that never happens again. <laughs> this colleague had eight different points to accuse Sarah of. And by the time she got to point four, the headmaster said, so would you like to go on to point five? And the colleague said, no, it's all right. I don't have a problem anymore. So there's Sarah just graciously responding and 
That makes the difference. That changed completely the view of that colleague that that colleague had of Sarah. And that relationship, Sarah says, from then on was absolutely, it was a very strong and a very positive relationship. So we too need to learn to act in grace, especially to those who would accuse us, especially to those who would seek to discredit us and respond in grace and to trust God. And to trust God. There is no need to defend ourselves. We are justified, not by our own words, but we are justified because we have faith in Christ Jesus. And so often, silence or a simple sorry speaks so much more than a rigorous defense of why we ought not to be accused. And then the final thing I'd like, like to bring to you is just this, that we ought to consider him. The weekend that changed the world is all about Jesus. It's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we look and as we consider him, we read this verse in Hebrews, which says, consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you would not grow weary and lose heart. Maybe there's some here and you're just weary and you're losing heart. Consider him. As we approach this Easter, come to him and just see the gracious acts and what he has done for you and what he suffered and the abominable trial he went through the abominable death he suffered, which we'll be thinking of in the next couple of weeks. Consider him. And may that be something that changes our hearts and changes our lives. We're going to sing Everyone Needs Compassion. It talks about a savior. It talks about the fact that everyone needs a savior. And we all do. But the second verse talks about taking me as you find me. All my fears and failures fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Can we sing this together as a real prayer of commitment to the Lord Jesus? and to what he has done for us, and to pray that this Easter time we truly will be changed as we consider him. <laughs>